Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, this is our last departmental seminar in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management for, uh, uh, for 2020. And uh, we have a really exciting speaker today. Um, it's my pleasure to, um, to introduce uh, Leah Stokes. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at UC Santa Barbara. She's also affiliated with the Brent School of the Environment, uh, as well as the Environmental Studies Department um, at Santa Barbara. Uh, Leah works on energy, climate, and environmental politics with a focus on the United States. Um, uh, one example of that was a book that she published in 2020, um, Short Circuiting Policy, Interest Groups in the Battle Over Clean Energy and Climate Policy in the American States, which examines the role that utilities have played in promoting climate denial and rolling back clean energy laws. Uh, it won the Best Energy Book in 2020 from the American Energy Society uh, and is available from Oxford University Press. Um, Prior to that, Leah completed a PhD in public policy from the Department of Urban Studies and Planning um, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, she's joining us from Santa Barbara today, and um, we all look forward to her, uh, to her seminar. So thank you. Thanks so much, Leah. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate that. And I'm going to be talking about that book today. That's what I'm going to talk about. And um, I think we've got an hour, right? Isn't that right? So I'll try to keep my talk to maybe 40 minutes or less so that we have lots of time for conversation and Q&A from all of you. Um, so as um, Daniel just mentioned, I wrote this book called Short Circuiting Policy, and I'm going to talk to you about it today. So um, when I was coming to the end of writing the book, I wanted to answer a question, which is, what is necessary? You know, what do we actually have to do in order to address climate change when it comes to the electricity sector? And part of the reason why I asked that question was because at the time, the Green New Deal was becoming a very prominent conversation. And I think what's so helpful about that dialogue is that it focuses on what's necessary, not just, you know, what's the policy mechanism that we like, but where do we need to go? And so I tried to answer that question in the introduction of my book, and I came up with this idea of a narwhal curve, um, which is actually somebody on Twitter named it that. But the point is that you create a benchmark and you say, here's where we are and here's where we need to go. So in 2018, when I last updated this data, we had about 36% of our electricity system coming from clean energy, which as you can see in the year 2018, if we were to start in the year 2000 and go out to 2050, every year you'd have to increase by two percentage points of the grid, right? Like two slices out of a hundred. And so we're right on track and you can see that's exactly where the black line grows. And actually in 2020, we are at about 40%. So again, we've grown by about two percentage points each year. So, oh wow, we're exactly on track. But um, that is only for planning to decarbonize by the year 2050 in the electricity sector. Well, what if we were planning to do it by 2035, which is the target that Joe Biden has adopted based on the work of Jay Inslee and that also Elizabeth Warren adopted during the Democratic primary. And so the target that we're all talking about now, whether that's the work of Grid Lab and actually another part of UC Berkeley or um, Energy Innovations work, or actually even just today, there was a great new paper out by Emily Grubert looking at this question too. Um, 2035 has really become this number that people have coalesced around, which is really exciting. And what you can see here is how much faster we need to be moving. And the thing is that it's not really 100% clean electricity we're targeting. It is 100% in the sense of the total grid, but the question is how big is the grid going to be, right? So as we electrify transportation and buildings and even parts of heavy industry, you know, we are going to need more electricity. How much more? Well, there's been a few different estimates done of that question. And the general consensus is maybe two times the size of the current grid. Um, so that means that we're actually targeting something like 200% <laughs> clean electricity. So imagine just how much steeper that slope would be if um, we were not just targeting the current percent of the grid, but a doubling of the grid. And what you'll also notice here is that um, we've really been living on borrowed time when it comes to our nuclear fleet and our hydropower resources. Uh, renewables, they're growing and that's wonderful, but especially if nuclear plants are going to retire and also just if we want to move faster, we have to be building renewables so much faster than we are. And, you know, there are estimates of exactly how much faster. I generally think it's like four times as fast, maybe eight times as fast, depending on what the target is and also, um, you know, what your assumptions are about how much the grid has to grow for electrification. 
So if you're interested in this argument or you're like teaching a class, you have a friend or whatever, I actually made a little video about this with my sister who's a video journalist, it was a lot of fun. Um, it's called the Narwhal Curve, it's like three minutes and you can Google it and it's cool. So there you go. Um, so where, you know, if we're on this pathway to try to clean up our electricity system, what has been happening? Well, overall, the federal government has largely failed to do uh, very much on this issue. Now, throughout the 1990s, advocates were trying to pass this policy that I'm going to spend a lot of today talking about, which was a renewable portfolio standard, now called a clean electricity standard. Basically, these policies target a certain percent of the grid being clean by a certain date. So 50% by 2050 or 100% by 2035, something like that. And despite advocates' efforts, they have never managed to get the federal government to pass this law. The closest we've ever come was back in 2009 when the Waxman-Markey bill was being debated and did pass the House. And that bill included a federal RPS, which was only for renewable energy that targeted 20% renewable energy by 2020. And it was a very, fairly soft target, meaning 8% could be met with energy efficiency. And the interesting thing is that this bill, um, when you look back, as I did for the book, it actually would have driven more progress than we've even made today. So we're not at 12% um, renewable energy in all the states across this country or in all the utility areas. So that actually would have been a policy that would have created pressure because we have some states that are quite far ahead and many that are far behind. And so by having a federal floor, you know, that would have lifted all the boats, so to speak. Of course, this bill did not pass the Senate. Um, and the Biden campaign has endorsed, as I've mentioned, this 100% clean electricity standard by 2035, which is very exciting. And um, I'm really excited about it. So what are the state laws that have been fueling decarbonization? Well, there are two main policies, renewable portfolio standards and net metering laws, or sometimes called net energy metering. Uh, as I mentioned, an RPS is a policy that says we're going to have X percent renewable or X percent clean energy by this date. Um, and you can see that these policies were passed throughout the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and net metering is a policy that basically allows people to put solar on their roof and feed their excess electricity back into the grid and be paid the same price that they would be buying electricity at. They, they are paid that price when they sell it, so the retail rate. Um, interestingly, uh, it was a grad student who did his PhD. Actually, there have been many graduates of Berkeley who have been critical in pushing these policies across this country. Um, so kind of interesting how uh, people who have come out of your programs, particularly ERG, have played an important role in fostering these policies across the country. And I tell some of the history of that in the book. Um, so where are we at today? And this map is always getting slightly out of date. And so it's even better than this map looks like because Arizona is poised to also have a 100% clean energy standard very soon. Um, but right now, one in three Americans live in a state or a city, not shown on this map, that is targeting 100% clean electricity. Now, of course, no state or city is targeting it well, not no city, no state is targeting 100% clean electricity by 2035. Um, we have 2040 and 2045 with um, uh, New York and California, um, and there's current discussions about maybe California ratcheting that up and moving faster. Um, but, you know, there's been a lot of momentum around this idea across the country. And I think that's why there's been so much excitement about a federal policy, too. Now, what my book really focuses on is the backlash to clean electricity. So when a lot of these early policies were passed, the theory was we get a small renewable portfolio standard or a small policy in place, clean electricity standard, and that's going to build these new advocates, right? It's going to incubate new industries. It's going to retire coal. And the balance of power between the people who want clean energy and the people who don't is going to shift because clean energy companies will gain more political power. And particularly in California, that dynamic has played out. So for example, when there were efforts to repeal California's net metering policy um, a few years ago, back in 2012, um, you know, the solar leasing companies who had a lot of influence with the governor met with them and said, don't do that. And they managed to pass a bill um, 
AB327 that didn't really weaken the policy nearly as much as we saw in other states. Um, so, and similarly, the way that the renewable portfolio standard has been designed in California has actually pushed a lot of the development into the state because of the bucket system. And that, which is basically a way that we're going to prioritize renewables that can actually be fed into the grid, which are largely renewables built in California. So that has meant that a lot of the labor um, to build the renewable energy has been built in state and has often been unionized. And so there have been, there's been a growing constituency in Sacramento to support this policy and to, and to support it being ratcheted up over time. So that kind of a dynamic we would call policy feedback that is positive, right? We pass a policy at time one, it reshapes the political landscape, we get more advocates, those advocates come back and lobby to expand the policy and you just get this beautiful virtuous cycle. Unfortunately, California is a little bit of an outlier in that that isn't how it's played out all across this country. Instead, we've seen interest group backlash where um, that positive feedback cycle has been disrupted by electric utilities and fossil fuel companies who see financial losses for their own business model in the clean energy transition. And so what I do in the book is try to describe the variety of tactics that these companies, fossil fuel companies and electric utilities have been using to undermine policy feedback and undermine the clean energy transition. And those include lobbying, implementation resistance, meaning you pass the law, but you try not to implement it fully, using the primaries to challenge Republicans, let's say, who are pro clean energy because they've seen job growth in their district, astroturfing, um, outside lobbying, which is organizing the public to share your views and court cases. And so I'm going to break down in the rest of this talk what all these different mechanisms are for resistance from the electric utility industry and fossil fuel companies. So this is kind of the model of change that I'm talking about here, the policy feedback theory. So right, you pass a bill in Congress or in a state legislature, it becomes a law, right? And often when we think about policy, that's kind of where our thinking ends. But what political science and policy feedback research reminds us is that actually that's just the beginning of the story in many ways, that the law itself reshapes the political landscape by giving resources to advocates and taking away resources for opponents. So laws are tools of power in many ways and that they redistribute resources in society. Think, for example, about the defund the police movement, right? The idea is in part that if we take away resources from the police and we give them to new institutions like um, mental health organizations that help people in distress, right? We're going to, in some ways, weaken the power of the police, including politically, because in some places, um, police uh, unions in, in particular can be very politically powerful forces. Um, so laws redistribute resources between advocates and opponents. In the case of clean energy laws, right, they build new clean energy companies, they bring resources into the clean energy industry, and they take away resources from dirty um, infrastructure. So those interest groups then respond to that implementation. They respond to the shift in balance of power. And of course the opponents, although they, although they may have lost some of their power, they still may be relatively much more powerful than the new, uh, the new companies, right? So the incumbents, electric utilities and fossil fuel companies, even if they've lost some of their relative power, they're still very powerful incumbents. And so what they do is they resist. And they can resist by lobbying directly as that arrow goes between the interest groups and the legislature, or they can, they can expand the scope of conflict, as we say, or um, go indirectly and use the public to try to influence the legislature. So I'm gonna talk about two ways that interest groups namely fossil fuel companies and electric utilities, have tried to use the public to undermine policy feedback and undermine that positive spiral where we would have a ratcheting up of clean electricity standards over time. So the first uh, is in Kansas, and I'm going to talk about what astroturfing is. So astroturfing is this thing that's been happening more and more from corporate lobby groups, um, corporate interest groups who uh, don't like a policy for some reason, and they don't have some kind of grassroots infrastructure. This is not the Sierra Club or something like that, right? But they want to make it seem like to the politicians that the public doesn't like their idea, doesn't like that law. And so what they do is they run public campaigns or public relations campaigns that make it seem like the public is opposed to a policy, even though that is not true. 
So for example, in Kansas, there was this new group that suddenly popped up called the Kansas Seniors Alliance. It didn't have a website, there was nobody really associated with it, but suddenly these flyers started to go around and they started to kind of try to influence politicians thinking as well as the public's thinking about the clean energy law in Kansas. And it said, Kansas seniors are already financially stressed. Higher utility bills aren't helping. Of course, there had been independent analyses showing that renewables were not uh, jacking up utility bills in Kansas, but that's irrelevant for the sake of this, right? So a journalist wanted to know who, who is the Kansas Seniors Alliance? So they went to the lawyer that had registered the group and they said, oh, hey, you know, who do you work for at the Kansas Seniors Alliance? And the lawyer said, I don't work for the Kansas Seniors Alliance. I work for Americans for Prosperity. What is Americans for Prosperity? This is the lobbying arm of Coke Industries, of course, a very powerful fossil fuel company that is headquartered in Kansas. And it was clear that they basically created this shell organization in order to try to make it seem like the public was opposed to a policy, even though they weren't. Now, astroturfing can get a lot worse than this example. So I'm going to tell you a story from New Orleans with the electric utility Entergy. In New Orleans, Entergy wanted to build a new gas plant. And in this case, they had to go to the city council to get approval for the gas plant. So there was a meeting at you know, a public hearing where the public could make their views known. And you'll see that at this public meeting, there's all these people wearing these matching orange shirts. They had um, these signs and seems like the public really wanted to build this gas plant, right? Power station equals jobs jobs giving community energy, right? So wow, who are all these people? Why do they want to build this gas plant? Why do they hate solar or something? So uh, journalists went up to these people and they said like, hey, why are you here? Like, you know, speaking up as a citizen on behalf of this utility. And they said, oh, I, I wasn't, I don't believe in this utility. I was paid to be here. I'm an out of work actor. These are the lines I'm supposed to read. This is what I'm supposed to say. And it turns out that Entergy, the utility, had spent $27,000 and hired a public relations firm who hired a bunch of paid actors to show up at a public meeting and argue in favor of a utility plant, uh, a new gas plant. And this is particularly nefarious when you think about the fact that there may be actual citizens who will be impacted in terms of like air quality, pollution by that gas plant, and they're going to have much harder time speaking at this public hearing when it's being stuffed with sort of an astroturfing campaign on behalf of a utility. So it's not just the public that uh, electric utilities and fossil fuel companies are manipulating or manipulating views of the public in order to influence uh, legislatures. They are also using political control to influence the legislature. What do I mean by that? I mean that, you know, when a company would like a Republican to be elected and not a Democrat, right? They're going to give campaign contributions. They're going to support that person to help them get elected. Now, they could also say, hey, this specific Republican, I don't like that Republican because they are pro clean energy. Think about somebody like Bob Inglis. Bob Inglis was a representative from South Carolina in Congress, and he had this awakening moment while he was serving and realized that he believed in climate change. He went on actually a couple scientific trips uh, while he was a legislator, I believe to Antarctica, and he saw the sort of ice core and the science and he thought, my gosh, climate change is real. And his son also went to him and said like, dad, climate change is real and you're kind of screwing my generation. And so Bob Inglis started to be a Republican in Congress who wanted to do something about climate change. So what happened to Bob Inglis? Well, Bob Inglis found himself with a very well-funded primary challenger and lost his primary and was no longer in Congress. So interest groups, by playing in primaries, can pick the kind of Republican that's getting elected, not just you know whether we get a Republican or a Democrat, but whether the Republican believes in clean energy or believes in climate action. And more and more, what these fossil companies and electric utilities are doing is they are threatening Republicans that are on the wrong side on clean energy or climate change. They say, if you vote for this bill, if you're pro clean energy, we're going to primary challenge you. And keep in mind that even if you don't 
um, win the primary challenge. That's still a really big threat, right? And everybody else in your caucus is going to know that that happened and they're going to be freaked out and they're going to say, you know what, this whole clean energy thing, it's just not worth it. I'm going to change my vote. And that isn't speculation on my part. We can literally see that happen in Kansas because we have basically a, um, a repeated panel where we see all the legislators vote at time one then we know because of something that was leaked to the press that Coke industry starts to lobby the Republicans and say, if you don't vote the right way, we're going to pull your money. And then we have a vote at time two on the exact same bill and suddenly a few less Republicans vote for the bill. Then we have a vote at time three and a few less Republicans vote on the bill and at time four, a few less. And eventually the bill gets passed and they repeal the clean energy target. And you have to remember that with somebody like Coke Industries in Kansas, what are the largest sources of campaign financing for a Republican in Kansas? Well, the number, the first one is the Kansas Republican Party, right? However, what is one of the top donors to the Kansas Republican Party? Coke Industries. Okay, the second biggest donor is the Kansas Chamber of Commerce. What is one of the top donors to the Kansas Chamber of Commerce? Oh, Coke Industries. And then one of the third top donors is Coke Industries. So fossil fuel money can actually pervade the thinking of an entire party. And people like Senator Whitehouse in the U.S. Senate argues that since the Citizens United decision, this kind of thinking has pervaded the entire Republican Party as they take more and more money from the fossil fuel industry, much of a dark money that is quite hard to trace. So what this has done is led to what we would call elite polarization. So that means that Republicans have become more anti-clean energy over time. Um, when we talk about polarization, people like Paul Pearson at Berkeley have done fantastic work showing that it's not really the Democratic Party and the Republican Party pulling away from each other. What it really is, is the Democratic Party staying about here and the Republican Party becoming an extremist party and becoming very anti-climate change and anti-many things. Um, and so when we talk about polarization, empirically, according to political science research, it's not two parties pulling apart. It's actually the Republican Party becoming an extremist party. And what you can see here is that in the early days of these policies, renewable portfolio standards, Republican governors were overwhelmingly the ones passing them. For example, uh, George W. Bush in Texas in 1999, he signed that policy to law. But when we fast forward to 2005, you can't find a single clean energy law that's being passed under a Republican governor anymore. And that's because the interest groups have wisened up to these policies, discovered that they don't like them, and lobbied against them, and driven the Republican Party away from the policy through things like primary challenges. Now, we know that the public follows the elites. Again, one of the people at Berkeley named Gabe Lenz uh, has done fantastic work. He's written a book called Follow the Leader, and it basically shows that a lot of what the public learns to think about a public policy issue, they learn from their co-partisan politicians. What do I mean by that? I mean that if Donald Trump is out there as a Republican saying climate change is not real, wind turbines are terrible, et cetera, they cause cancer, conspiracy theories like that, it's more likely that the Republican masses, everyday Republican people, will start to believe those things and will start to look more and more like the elites. And so what happens is as the fossil fuel industry and electric utilities start to mobilize against clean energy around, for example, the waxman markey bill, around a lot of these policies in the states around 2008 and 2009, they managed to drive the Republican Party away from these policies. And by extension, we see a big polarization amongst the Republican um, masses overall, because the public is listening to co-partisan elites. Okay, so what do I write about in this book? I go through a number of cases where clean energy laws have been passed and there have been attacks on them by fossil fuel companies and electric utilities. I talk about probably the most classic case of um, clean energy laws, which is Texas's wind energy policy, as well as their transmission law. Um, and then I tell a, a much less well-known story, which is that years after that, in 2005, when the CREZ law was passed, that's the transmission policy, there was actually an effort to um, expand the renewable energy law to include solar and how even though they passed that law, it was never implemented. I talk about Kansas, which I've previewed a bunch here, where Coke Industries is headquartered, Arizona, fascinating story in Arizona, enormous amounts of corruption there, and even more fascinating, Ohio, where there's like an FBI case and every day there's new drama in Ohio. Um, but the basic thing is a couple years ago, they passed HB6, I guess it was last year, and this was a massive coal bailout and they repealed their clean energy law and it was the worst energy policy in the country. 
And I've done a lot of writing about that. Okay, so there's one thing I wanna leave you with as I begin to wrap up the talk portion here, which is that a lot of people know that fossil fuel companies have promoted climate denial and climate delay. They know that because of journalists' work, as well as excellent research by people like Naomi Oreskes, Eric Conway, Jeffrey Supran, um, lots of others, Robert Rule, who have documented the role that fossil fuel companies have played in climate denial, as well as many uh, organizations doing work on this. But what a lot of people don't know is that electric utilities were also very involved in these efforts. And I tried to document some of that in my book. So electric utilities made choices throughout the 20th century that really exacerbated the climate crisis. They promoted a very wasteful energy system by trying to drive out industrial cogeneration at the beginning of the century, which you may know is a much more efficient process because you're using both heat and electricity. Um, they promoted climate denial very actively throughout the 1990s and actually with some students right now, I'm finishing a paper that documents um, their role in promoting climate denial and looks at what they talked about internally um, versus what they put out, out, out externally and what, what kind of front groups the industry was funding. And they've also worked, as I mentioned, uh, as I study throughout the book, to roll back clean energy laws and attack net metering and attack clean energy standards, et cetera. And if you don't have a copy of my book and you want to just read a summary of this, I published an excerpt on the website Drilled News, or it's also just in my book. If you want to buy a copy of my book, um, you can go to the Oxford University Press website or just bit.ly slash scp book. There's a 30% discount code. You can screenshot it now, give it to anybody, it doesn't matter. Feel free to take 30% off, it doesn't matter. There's also a Kindle ebook, which is like 15 bucks, and there's an audiobook, um, which is pretty cool. So I listen to a lot of audiobooks. So if you want an audiobook, go for it. I don't read the audiobook. People often ask me that. Um, sorry. And so in terms of the broader conversation, just to zoom out from my specific book, I'm sure a lot of people right now are thinking about the federal policy opportunity. And of course, with the Biden administration, we have a big opportunity to try to scale up some of these state and local actions that I've been talking about in 2021. Now, it would be great to get comprehensive climate legislation, but given the way the Senate went, that might not happen. But there are still many opportunities, including through executive action, to work on what myself and others at, uh, for example, Evergreen Action, the former Inslee campaign, have been talking about, which is standards, investments, and justice. And this standards, investment, justice approach is, I think, a new way of thinking about climate policy that really centers the benefits of action rather than centering the costs of action and make sure that issues like income inequality and racial injustice are at the core of what we're talking about um, as we go forward. So uh, many people also want to know, can we actually do this? Can we clean up our electricity system fast? And I would point you to a fantastic report by some other people at Berkeley, as well as Grid Lab and Energy Innovation. It's the 2035report.com. And it's an awesome report that just talks about what's possible. And they say that we can clean up 90% of our electricity system by 2035 and save people money on their bills, let alone save people health costs and save you know many black children from having asthma, Etc. So it's a great thing. Um, another interesting thing that's happened recently in the Bay Area is that Google has started to emerge as a bit of a leader in this area. And I just want to call out in particular this target that they've put forward, which is to have 100% clean electricity in real time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week at all their facilities across this country. And keep in mind that Google is one of the largest electricity consumers in the country. So that is not a small thing. That's like a really big pledge. And it's not just like buying recs, as we say, which are these credits that say somebody else made some clean energy at some point and I bought the credit. So it's like, I got that clean energy. No, this is real time, actual delivered electricity to all facilities by 2030. And we're a company like Google able to do that, especially at 100%. That would be very transformative in terms of technology, innovation, management systems that could be used for um, cleaning up the rest of the country. Um, I'll also say that I do a lot of climate advocacy and a couple of projects that you might be interested in are this podcast that I've launched um, called A Matter of Degrees. We actually have a whole episode talking about the 2035 target and where it came from and why it's uh, doable. And so you can check that out. We got lots of other topics too. Um, and then I'm also part of this book over my shoulder. You can see it. It's called All We Can Save. It's an edited collection of essays by women in the climate movement 
diversity of age, race, background, location. Um, and it's a really cool book. And it's actually like a nice present if you need to give somebody a present who's like a climate advocate. So just wanted to mention that. Um, yeah, and thank you so much. It was wonderful to be invited and talk to you. And I'm sure there's some of my friends in the audience here listening to me go on. And now we've got a solid 20, 25 minutes for questions. So happy to uh, do that now. And I'll stop sharing my slides. Great, thank you so much, Leah. Um, what we're gonna do now, we're gonna have an open Q&A. Um, speakers are absolutely allowed to unmute themselves. Um, or they're also um, able to um, type their question in chat and I can uh, either read it or um, call on you to, um, to ask the question. Um, do we have anyone that wants to get started? Well, I will get started if, if there's, if, you know, while, while, we're, while, while we're waiting for and formulating our questions. Um, Leah, you, you mentioned you, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the political science theory of, of, um, around kind of ordinary voters adopting the views of their elders uh, and, you know, repeating and kind of parroting what is, what, is, what is said to them by politicians. I'm wondering if you could talk about that phenomena and, uh, and, and, and uh, polarization around climate in the United States. Um, have people thought about what, what, it, what it will take at a federal level in order to make climate change uh, no longer a partisan issue, and if that if if um if there are theories about whether that needs to be elite driven or 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 more public driven. Well, one of the arguments that I make in my book is that polarization on climate change is not an accident, and it's not something natural to the Republican Party. It is a concerted out. It's an F, it's an outcome from a concerted effort of interest groups to polarize the party for their own financial gain, right? So th that's the argument that I make in the book. Um, and I have lots of evidence to suggest that, right? So it's not like, oh, it's just the Republican way to wanna mess up the entire planet <laughs> for future generations. In fact, there's some interesting polling from like Pew and also the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, which shows that young Republicans are quite worried about climate change. Unsurprisingly, they would also like to have a livable planet even if they're Republicans. And so I don't think that this is like some outcome that comes out of the, who the Republican Party is or their principles by any means. It is an outcome that comes out of a campaign to um, co-opt and capture the, the Republican Party. And you know, we could talk about this on lots of different issues, but I think that the fossil fuel industry and the electric utility industry has been, has been very embedded within the Republican Party, particularly over the last decade, and that it has driven them away from this. And one of the key mechanisms that I show a lot of evidence for is the way that they play in primaries and basically threaten any Republican who is willing to act on climate change. So a lot of the solutions to this polarization amongst the mass public tends to be like, well, if we like frame it in a different way, or if we like, um, you know, I don't know, like give people checks through, through cap and dividend or something like make, you know, something will make it better. And it's like, fundamentally, the Citizens United decision, the amount of money in politics, the capture of our political system by fossil fuel companies and electric utilities, like that's not solved by framing the issue in a slightly different way. I think it's like a fundamental material conflict. So what does solve it? Well, the one silver lining right now is that the oil price is so low Lots of fossil fuel companies are going bankrupt. They don't have as many resources as they used to have. They're losing some of their political influence. And it may be that the industry begins to kind of collapse and begins to lose some of its political power and influence. And then slowly over time, the clean energy, clean energy industry starts to, to increase its political power. Um, so yeah, I have a very materialist view on this, I suppose you could say. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't like frame things as well as we can, and we shouldn't try to find Republican allies. And, you know, we shouldn't say that all Republicans don't care about climate change, because some do. But I think we need to be very clear eyed about how money in politics really has corrupted the Republican Party's views on climate change. Thank you, Leah. Um, Kate, I saw you um, put yourself on video. I imagine you have a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Leah, thank you. Great talk. It's great to hear, hear about your book. Um, I was going to just see, well, a couple of things. One is, um, well, we really got three questions here. So one is, how do you scale this up to the global level? Ah. I mean, we talk a lot about how the various uh, oil fossil fuel companies are interacting with Paris or, well, certainly with the climate 
negotiations up to Paris. Do we see any shifts in, in the situation? How are, are the, the Koch brothers moving globally in terms of who they're funding at that level? Or are the European companies managing to balance? So how are you seeing all of this play out globally? Um, you don't need to answer this, but the petrochemical um, industry is something of interest to me with plastics right now. And you're seeing some very similar kinds of um, fight back issues in terms of rolling back plastic bag bans that completely taking advantage of the COVID situation where everyone's like, oh no, we need plastic bags and single use plastics. So wow. they're quite powerful. I was wondering if you're seeing any interlinkages between those folks. I mean, I know it's basically the same industry. So um, <laughs> <laughs> are they not hurting? Yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> their activism. Um, all we can save is sold out. I tried to order a copy. What? And um, they said if I don't, they haven't got it in five weeks, so I'm going to refund my money. So I'm I'm talking to Susie Moser about that. You know, um, I have a couple extra copies, Kate. Why don't you send me an email? Okay, I'll do that. I would love a copy because I can use it next semester in class too. And yeah. <laughs> one of the things I, I um, always think you could talk to our students a little bit about is that you really balance a public outreach side to your work along with all the pressures of being an assistant professor and making tenure. And I was wondering if you had any advice for people who are interested in, in following that path. Okay, those are, that's I will, this yeah, is like, how long do I have, 20 minutes? <laughs> in three minutes, go. Okay, so, um, you know, that's a great question. Nobody's really asked me about how do I scale up the interest group things globally before. And that's a very obvious question. I don't know why, you know, we can think about other things like the North South and like, you know, the loss and damage negotiations and, and more general like materialistic negotiations in the global negotiations. But in terms of the interest group influence, that is a great question. I tend to have the view that global negotiations over climate change are a big, if we were like an have a function. I mean, not, I'm not trying to be reductionistic. I just mean like, like, what is it made up of? I think a huge input is the domestic politics. And so all of this stuff that I'm talking about in the United States exists in a lot of other countries. Like, you, I'm, you know, Maddow's book, Carbon Captured, where he goes through all this kind of stuff and your work too, right? Like, you can look at other countries and find these same kinds of symbiotic relationships between the industry and sometimes labor in the industry and uh, outcomes. And then when countries don't themselves make very intense commitments, right, that then feeds into the Paris process through like the NDCs, right? So I think that in many ways, the influence of the industry in these domestic fights dramatically constrains what is possible to do at the global level. Um, so, and then I imagine they also just go directly and do things nefariously directly. I actually wrote this game, which is a negotiation game to teach about international environmental trees called the Mercury game. And we make a role in the game, the, the, we made it up, but it's called like the, the Coal Power Association. And they go and they like spread lies about how coal doesn't cause mercury and mercury is all natural and shit like that. So, you know, I'm sure there are channels of direct influence into the, the cop of these sorts of nefarious things. I, I haven't studied it myself. Petrochemicals, great question, big issue. Plastics, terrible. We aren't even really studying it yet. I mean, you know, I know waste is a thing that you've worked on, but like, wow, it's just, it's crazy. Um, and yeah, I, I don't I, I don't even feel like that's on our radar yet. And there's a lot of concern that what if we continue to extract oil rather than using it for like our cars and all these other things, it just becomes a petrochemical industry. And the worst actors in my Texas case, which is in my book, are um, like there's the, the chemicals association there, there's the uh, indu the association of manufacturers, the, in the industrial energy users, these are all petrochemical companies basically. And they're always opposed to clean energy standards. And one thing that they do is they actually get laws written so that they don't have to comply with the clean electricity standard, meaning all their load gets opted out of the system, which is a very messed up thing for many reasons. But um, yeah, it's a very tricky industry. And I think we're only at the beginning of the problems there. Public outreach. Um, yeah, I guess I feel that climate change is a horrible existential threat and that it's very nice to write papers and obviously I do that um, and to be a normal academic, but I don't feel like it is um, enough personally. I'm not imposing that view on others, but I just feel like I feel responsibility to try to make as big of a difference as I can. And I'm always 
thinking about different ways to make a difference. And the skills that we have as academics include like writing, speaking, you know, like we can do things that can help ideas, right? facts we can shift the narrative and so i think that it's really valuable and i even started doing this a little bit in grad school obviously it amplified a lot when i was a professor but I, I think it is very valuable and that people should jump in and join the fight because there was always a view that like oh you're gonna get punished for doing this stuff but i think the academy has changed enormously and i don't think you're gonna get punished i mean maybe if you're in like some square discipline or something but in the vast majority of places like i think you'll get rewarded for being a public facing person and, and, and having relevance for debates. Yeah, we're certainly working on that here. So all, all the leadership we can get in terms of what people are expected to do moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Great to see you. And really do send me an email and I'll- I will. No, no right, after, right after this. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I have plenty I can chime in with as well, but want to make sure everyone else does. People are shy today. People are shy today. Not oh, a problem. Oh, somebody pop on. Gotami. Hi, Leah. This is Gothami. I'm also at Berg, so I'm eager to kind of um, uh, get a bit of Berg history from your book. Um, I was just kind of curious, like you mentioned Citizens United a fair number of times, and I kind of expect the clean energy um, industry to also utilize Citizens United for their own benefit. I'm just curious, do they have the same <clears throat> long-term moral compass about stepping back when there might be other technologies that come out in the future um, that are less harmful to the environment or more, um, or provide greater electrical equity um, access? And just wondering, it's just the way that the laws are built at the moment just seem to, um, it doesn't matter who's in power at the moment. It's just someone they will be taken advantage of. Yeah, I mean, I hear the nefarious feeling that you, the, the feeling that this is a bad system and I would agree with you. Um, the sad thing is that, of course, in the system that we have where you have unlimited spending on political speech, money is power and you can spend more. And of course it's not one-to-one -one by any means. Like you could spend money on politics very ineffectively and like back bad campaigns and make shitty ads and not be very effective. But still overall, the ability to have more resources and spend more resources on politics is quite problematic. Now, as the clean energy industry grows, I think it is maturing and becoming much more politically organized and engaged in a way that I think will help it uh, counterbalance the power of the fossil fuel energy. So we could be hopeful and be like, oh, we could get rid of Citizens United. And obviously I would support that. But in the absence of that outcome, I think it's better to have a balance of power and to have advocates challenging opponents. And so one thing that I write about in my book is the need for like more political action committees from the clean energy industry, more, more engagement. And what's been so cool during the democratic primary, well, no, sorry, during the general, it's all the money that flowed into the Biden campaign and all the organizing and, and energy from the climate and clean energy community and specifically clean energy for Biden, for example, which is this group that was uh, started by a bunch of people that's been very influential. Um, Lisa Friedman has written an article in the New York Times suggesting maybe like 5% of donations to the Biden campaign came from climate. And I think that's important because the status quo thinking amongst the Democratic Party for a long time you know, going back to Al Gore, if not before, is that nobody cares about climate. Nobody votes on climate. Nobody donates or gives time based on climate. And we have to change that thinking if we have any hope in uh, getting the, the party to prioritize this. So I think it's been hopeful to see so much more resources flow into that. And I think you're seeing in the way that Biden has been talking about the four crises and climate change being one of them and prioritizing it in terms of appointments and everything else that, that we are light years ahead of where we would have been in years past. Nicholas. Is that hey, right? yeah, I, sorry. Can, can you hear me? Great. I can't quite see your name, but I think that's what it is. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, I actually have kind of a follow up to that. Um, I'm also an ERG student with GoToMe. Uh, and re the Biden climate plan, which you've kind of ref referenced a couple times, I was just curious what your impressions were on the like difference in how his climate plan was detailed on his campaign page versus how it's detailed now on the Build Back Better transition page and sort of like 
I mean, the campaign one is like 10 times longer. There's all these details and all these things. Um, but there are certain elements that aren't even really represented in a parsed down version of this sort of new one. And it's kind of hard to know how to read the kind of refined climate messaging. Are there specific on... things you're thinking of? Yeah, like, I mean, like in the original one, there's all this language about leveraging international players through trade to try to like uh, encourage green development and things like that. And there's all this like polluter pay stuff and, you know, pretty aggressive language, including like maybe even jail time for fossil fuel execs and all this stuff. And um, and it's hard to know how much of it is sort of maybe strategic posturing to, to people across the spectrum during the campaign versus now. And, and the one on Build Back Better is like, a lot more focus on kind of just domestic kind of job creation while we're doing this thing. So I was just curious if maybe that reflects some of the Senate outcome and kind of being more realistic with goals or if you have thoughts on like how internal conversations may have changed or, or if it's really just kind of like an abbreviated version. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, I often think that sometimes things that maybe look bad could be, you know, incompetence or, um, you know, I don't know, somebody else copied and pasted it or they had to make it a different length or I have no idea. Um, you know, the transition has its own staffing and it is separate from even the campaign or like a lot of the work that was done then. So maybe that explains it. But I mean, in general, to step back, you know, if you want to advocate for certain outcomes or you think something's missing, um, a lot of the focus right now is very fixated on who is going to run things. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that there is some value to that kind of activism. I don't always agree with everything that people say about who is good or who is bad or whatever, but more broadly, the who, who, who focus is, uh, is taking back from some of the things you're talking about, which is the substance and what do we want. And I think highlighting some of the commitments that have been made, for example, Evergreen Action went through and did this 46 for 46 document where they said, here are 46 executive actions that Biden committed to in his plan, right? And tried to highlight that. And now they're doing this like five things in each agency to like make all of all agencies a climate agency. And I think that that substantive focus and holding the campaign to their commitments is a powerful thing to be doing right now. Um, mm -hmm. You're right that with the way the Senate is, there's probably been some shift in thinking about how can we achieve some of the goals that we want to achieve. My general view, which could be wrong, I'm open to being wrong, and maybe I'm an optimist, is that I actually think that the Biden campaign and Joe Biden himself is committed to climate action. I, I think that. Um, I could be wrong, and I guess the proof will be in the pudding, but I'm not coming from a place of skepticism or, you know, conflict at this point. I, I think that, you know, it's going to be difficult to do things, but that they are pretty committed to it. And so mm -hmm. hopefully they'll continue to do that and um, make progress. And so, so that's just my view. I know other people have different views or they're worried and it's understandable why people are worried because the stakes are really, really big. Um, but, but my own view is that I think they're, they're really going to do shit, which would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. that cool. Thanks. Great, hey, Leah, one more question from me. Um, and if someone else wants to jump in, please, please go ahead. I think here too. I don't know if Jared wanted to ask. Yeah, oh, yes. Um, great. Go ahead, sorry, Jared. Daniel. Um, yeah, thanks, Leah, for the great book and great talk. Um, I'm just, just to return to, to the book, and I'm still going through it, so maybe this answer's in the book. And I just need Yeah, to Jared, didn't you look at footnote 12 <laughs> in chapter 5? God. Yeah, it's, it's my mistake. I, I apologize. <laughs> Um, but I'm just curious about the variation in policy feedback. And so I think you give us a really good example of why it's not working in some places, but there's variation. So why is it, and you kind of talked about the California case, but I'm sure, I mean, there must be other cases about why it did work. And so why we did get that virtuous sort of, that virtuous uh, feedback loop. And so, I mean, one thing I think, okay, it's industry opposition, there's variation in that, that maybe electricity companies, companies in some states sort of sign on to mm -hmm. uh, RPSs, for example, and then they fight them in other states? Mm -hmm. um, or is it something about party control, just a sort of a, a party effect? Mm -hmm. And so curious, or labor as well, variation in unions and how unions are in the policy making process. So that's sort of one question. And then another one is about voters. And I mean, sort of the story you gave us now is that it's kind of almost a false consciousness. And I, and I totally agree with you that voters, especially Republican voters, I mean, voters pick up on elite cues. 
And it's no surprise that once the party starts moving in one direction, voters, we see voters following. But isn't there sort of also the real risk of electoral backlash from higher costs that these policies might impose on households? And indeed, your paper in AJPS sort of speaks to this as well, right? And so, I mean, is it only a, a sort of a story of voters getting duped? Or no, there's also, there is kind of also, you know, grassroots backlash against these sorts of policies. Absolutely. Okay, I'll take the second one first and then go back to the first one. Um, so I think that electoral backlash is a very big risk. And this is in large part why I'm not a huge fan of a carbon price. Um, because I think what a carbon price fundamentally does is it pushes the cost of the transition onto consumers. And when you do that under massive income inequality, um, it's also very salient, it's very visible. You know, you're putting a cost onto the public that they can all see. Um, and the energy transition does not have to be financed that way. That's not a requirement. You know, economists make us think that the only thing we can do is align price signals and then that's the only solution. And no, we could also invest. We could also spend money. We can think about it as an asset infrastructure turnover problem, like for example, Rewiring America has been proposing and say that, you know, when anybody buys a car, we want the default choice to be an electric car. Or we could have standards where it's like, X percent of cars need to be electric vehicles or whatever by X date. You know, 100% of the electricity system has to be this by this date, right? So we can say, here's where we're going, here's the outcome. And when it comes to the costs of the transition, some of the modeling suggests that there isn't a lot of costs to turning to a clean electricity sector, at least not for the first 90%. So it actually can be cheaper to do this. And that's not even including negative externalities. That's just literally the price uh, at the consumer level. And the other thing is that, um, you know, let's say we have coal plant debt, stranded assets, basically, or stranded costs. Um, we don't have to say consumers pick up the tab for that. I mean, ideally, shareholders would pick up the tab for that because they made terrible investments. But we can also say that the federal government writes off this bad debt in exchange for building clean energy. And that shifts the cost of the transition onto the general government balance sheet, which means we can pay for it in lots of different ways, in debt, in taxes on super wealthy people, and taxes on corporations, right? Like, we don't have to make everyday Americans pay for a carbon price. And a carbon price is fundamentally regressive. It is. We can make it less regressive, of course, through dividends. But what the research showed is uh, by people like Madam Mildenberger, Kathy Harrison, and Eric LaChapelle, who have studied actual price and dividends in Canada in practice is that people don't correctly perceive the benefits that they're getting. So for example, we live in California. Did you guys all know that you get these like little utility kickbacks on your bills uh, every once in a while? I think it's like, I don't even know how often it is. I study this stuff. Maybe it's like twice a year, I get an email and it's like, you got a thing. It's to do with AB32 and SB32. Anyway, my point is that's not visible, right? I have no idea how much money I'm getting back from that, right? And it is very much visible to people. So, so I think electoral backlash is a huge risk. And I view the standards investment justice approach as one that minimizes electoral backlash. In terms of your first question, which was about um, sort of the cases and, and what is happening here, I think that when we see the good lock-in cases, which I have studied California, I just didn't write it in the book. I did more work on California than anywhere else. I just didn't put it in the book because um, I'm crazy. And, you know, the lock-in there happened because, as I said, they structured the policies that it created benefits in California, so that it created constituents in California, things like solar leasing companies, labor, organized labor, which got contracts to build giant solar farms, for example. And so when they started to ratchet it up, like with SB 100, there were constituents there to say, we want this policy. And of course, in California, the um, electric utilities are not as politically powerful. PG&E is like hated because of the uh, pipeline explosion and the fires and a bajillion other things. And so the regulator, the Public Utility Commission, has a lot more teeth in California than in other states. And we also have the Intervenor Compensation Program, which is a way to tilt the playing field and give advocates more ability to intervene in the process and not just allow utilities to dominate the process. So that's a happy story. There's a few others. And I've been studying like New Mexico and Colorado and other places because there is some good things happening. But um, overall, the book is more about documenting the bad things and the ways that the transition is slowed down than it is about the happy amplifying story that I know everybody always loves to hear. <laughs> Great. 
Thank you, Leah. Um, we just have time for probably one more question. I'll, I'll try to ask it and we can make it brief. I'm wondering, as we as we look towards other sectors, the transportation sector, the industrial sector, um, and, uh, you know, even negative emissions technologies for uh, for getting decarbonization beyond the electricity sector. I'm wondering, are there are there are there clear lessons? Are there clear signals on the wall around how interest groups are going to act or um, um, do we know if these fights are going to look the same um, or are they going to look fundamentally different in those sectors? Well, we already have some news. I mean, uh, there were, people don't remember this, but there was a hit job on Elon Musk maybe four years ago. A website went up called Who is Elon Musk? And no, it was not from the left. <laughs> it was probably from fossil fuel companies. This is also before Elon got as crazy as he tends to be um, and was more beloved amongst people. Um, and they were trying to undermine the company, right? And um, yeah, they went after him. It was a dark money campaign. You can read about that. Uh, you know, there are legitimate reasons to criticize Tesla, and I'm not saying people shouldn't, but a lot of the hit jobs on these companies come from fossil fuel industries who don't want to like lose their oil share, American Petroleum Institute, et cetera. And when we think about the fact that the tax credits for EVs has not been re-extended federally, right? It's like, it's not necessarily even a tax. It can be that a policy sunsets and we never enact it again, right? And so we already see these attacks on electric vehicles. They're not as prominent. I obviously haven't like formally studied them and written on them, but they exist. And if you want to talk about electrification. Hello, California. Hello, SoCal Gas and Sempra. There's crazy fights going on right now where Sempra is, and through SoCal Gas has been funding fake front groups, exactly this kind of astroturfing thing, claiming that Californians don't want to electrify their homes and claiming that the NAACP is against San Luis Obispo passing an electrification rule for new buildings, right? Like, there are, there are dark money things happening in California on this, in this exact way. And the interesting thing is that the Public Utility Commission through the, uh, I think, Advocates Office has been trying to hold SoCal Gas accountable because it's not allowed to take ratepayer funds and do this kind of stuff. But they just aren't complying with the request to give the documents about how they spent the money. And the Public Utility Commission isn't making them comply. So yeah, don't worry. These fights are, it's the same kind of playbook. It is playing out in the transportation sector in a lower profile way and it is starting to play out in the electrification of building sector um, and i'm quite interested in the building electrification piece right now uh, i think that, that that there's some interesting stuff going on there that we need to elevate um, because th we have a lot of momentum right now oakland just passed the same thing that berkeley has already passed like two days ago and so yeah, I think that, that we're going to start to see momentum there. And, and just like my book shows, as we start to get these policies and we start to get momentum, that's when the industry is going to go, oh, shit, and they're going to mobilize and attack the progress that we're making. Great. We're coming up on time. I'm wondering if there are any last-minute last questions from anyone else. Well, it was really nice to be here with all of you. As I mentioned, I talked to a lot of Berkeley people writing this book. I drew on a lot of research from the community. So I think Berkeley and ERG in particular have a long history of doing important stuff in this space. So hopefully you all feel that you're part of that tradition and will continue to you know, make a difference because being an academic doesn't mean that you can't do things. I'll just tell you that a person from a, with an ERG PhD is the guy who went across the country and uh, helped pass a lot of net metering policies. So you, know, you don't have to just write papers or stick you know, in a little square. You can do big things and make a big difference um, in this fight. So I encourage people to do that. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Leah. And I think, um, you know, uh, everyone, please uh, feel free to chime in on the chat. Thank Leah for, for her talk. Um, I think we all really enjoyed not only the presentation, but also the really lively uh, Q&A period. So thanks again. Okay, it was wonderful to see everybody. And when you can buy this book again, I guess try to buy it. I guess you can. <laughs> it's, it's on the web. You can get an e-version that's not, not a Kindle. <laughs> you, they've got an e one of those how to read e-books is also up there. But a paper oh, You can't get a Kindle? Strange. You probably can, but I was going straight to the website. Oh, uh, I think you can probably get it if you go on Amazon to get a Kindle or whatever.